carbon dioxide coming out of the peatland increases. So if you drain a peat bog, you start to lose the carbon that's been stored for thousands of years. The way this works is that the carbon is essentially just the peat. The peat is the dead plant remains, and that carbon that they absorb from photosynthesis is locked up in the dead plants in the waterlogged situation. If you lower the water table and the oxygen starts to come into the system, the peat dries out, bacteria start to oxidize, and the stored carbon is converted into carbon dioxide and enters the atmosphere. But it also comes out as particulates, as dissolved organic carbon, it goes into the water systems, and that causes problems for drinking water. If you have dissolved organic carbon, it creates the brown water color that companies then have to spend millions of pounds removing from the drinking water to meet drinking water standards. So there's a problem both in entering the atmosphere directly, but also indirectly going through our water systems, that loss of carbon from the system. And as we saw earlier, the combination of loss of carbon physically, you lose, the, the bog shrinks, and the, the, the peat is lost out of the system, and you can lose many meters of peat in a few decades. One of the questions often comes up is about <coughs> methane. So a lot of people are aware that methane comes out of a healthy natural peatland. It's part of the, the deep down breakdown of the, the peat. In a very healthy peatland with a lot of sphagnum on the top, that methane is then oxidized again and doesn't get released as methane. Uh, it's kept in the system. But if you drain a peatland, the methane is actually lower because the system's less wet, there's less methane production. So bearing in mind that methane's 25 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a <coughs> greenhouse gas, there was a lot of concern that keeping peatlands wet was going to cause a huge amount of methane to enter the atmosphere. But actually what's been shown is that if you've got a natural peatland functioning well, the level of methane with the amount of carbon sequestration, basically the system's in a neutral state. It's not adding to our global warming problems in its healthy state. But if you drain it, the total amount of carbon dioxide is way more than the amount of methane coming out of a healthy bog. So it, it's far worse, in, in global warming terms, it's far worse to have a damaged bog <coughs> than to have a healthy bog. And so that's the challenge for us. Let's keep the peatlands healthy and not let them become damaged. And if they have become damaged, let's re-wet them and repair them because that's the best game for uh, climate change. So these damaged peatlands, so much carbon is coming out of them that it completely outweighs any of the methane uh, impacts of a healthy peatland. So, Keeping peatlands wet and healthy is the goal for climate change. And that's now been reflected, as I said, in the Kyoto Protocol. We have this new article under the climate change framework which says that a party included in Annex 1 countries may choose to account for greenhouse gas emissions by sources and removals resulting from the following activities, which includes, for the first time since last year, wetland drainage and re-wetting. So if you restore a peatland, you can actually, the, the, the reduction in the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere can actually go into your national accounts. And that's a very powerful driver in favor of uh, peatland conservation now. It also means that not only national governments can get the benefit of that carbon saving, but also the, the markets that have been developed for carbon can now engage. It's not just pre-planting that's uh, one of the main land use options. We now have re-wetting of peat bulbs and uh, peat stems. In order to be <coughs> credible, there's been a lot of scientific work to try and make sure that there are standards. So there's a, now a new voluntary carbon standard for restoration of peatlands. There has to be some numbers. We need to know how much carbon is saved when you restore a hectare of peatland. And so the, there's work now um, to, to provide that there's a model that's being developed, the guest model, and across the world, it's interesting, peatlands tend to behave in similar ways and we're now starting to get some good figures that the IPCC are starting to adopt as well as um, figures that the, the voluntary carbon market can adopt. That's still a growing area, we need to refine and improve these numbers but certainly there's enough now to, uh, to allow the voluntary carbon market to proceed. And all of this has been written up in a report that's available um, explaining how the voluntary carbon market could work. 
The voluntary carbon market, however, is always going to be small in relation to the, to the potential money that's available. The big goal will be in five years' time, hopefully, when we can get this applied under the compliance market or joint implementation, where we can then get serious amounts of money <coughs> being spent on peatland restoration. The beauty of all this, as we said, was that it's long been a biodiversity goal to conserve and restore peatlands. It's a rare habitat, it's got many rare and interesting species, it's a fantastic <coughs> part of our natural environment and quite rightly is a priority for biodiversity conservation. But what we're seeing now is that policy is recognizing that there are ecosystem service benefits that have a value, a financial value, and that paying for those benefits could help us expand the work of restoring and repairing peatlands, which the biodiversity funding alone hasn't managed to secure. And so that's why we're keen to see this new funding through these recognition of the, the ecosystem service benefits. So when the Biodiversity Convention uh, in, uh, in uh, Japan was held, you saw The Economist with this uh, dramatic headline, Forests, the world's lungs, and how to save them. What we want to see for the peatlands is perhaps uh, a slightly more challenging uh, objective, but it's the point here that the liver is never the most favorite organ, but if you don't have it, you really notice it's not working. And the point here with peatlands is they're not loved, People don't really appreciate them, but they're doing an incredibly important job. And if, if we leave them in their damaged state, we really will find uh, a problem. Now, we're going to have uh, a session where we've introduced the concept of peatlands and their importance for climate change. We'll look in a little bit more detail later on at how this works um, and the specifics of what we've learned in the UK about peatlands and the, their role with climate change. But what we're really here to do is how do we deliver action for peatlands? There is no question they're important. That's been established, it's in law, but it's how do we actually get the money into restoring and uh, repairing and conserving our peat bogs? Um, Johnny, do you want to, to sort of start off this discussion? Yeah, do you want to go back to the last slide because that had the uh, questions on it. It seems to be a bit temperamental with uh, my core presentation. Um, so, we, we would really invite comments and discussion from, from, from the audience at this point. Um, um, can, can, we, can we just maybe do a show of hands uh, to see what, what kind of background you're all from? Is that, uh, those, those people that work for an NGO, could you put your hands up? Not that many of them. Um, the academics in the room, could they put their hands up? A few more academics. Government organisations. One government represents any other categories that There's some people who haven't put their hands up. What have we missed? <laughs> Members of the general public. Um, okay, so so there's, there's actually quite a good spread then between uh, non governmental, <coughs> governmental, and uh, academics. Um, would anybody um, like to share any experience they've they've they've, they've had with people? Is, 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 is there anybody in the room which is actually being proactively involved in people restoration projects or policy? Uh, my name is Andrew Hill. My background is in uh, UK forestry, so historically the industry was responsible for some of those excellent photographs from Google Earth. Uh, but we've also more recently been involved in uh, restoring peatlands and rewetting and actually techniques of removing uh, crops off these sites and restoring <coughs> So, in, in which part of uh, the world is that? All over the UK, really. All over the UK, yeah. Has, has anybody else been involved in big projects? Uh, Jens Brüggemann, I uh, used to work for Müritz National Park in northeastern Germany, uh, not far away from Greifswald, where you're probably cooperating with. And uh, we've done quite a few uh, peatland restoration projects on a low scale in, in the national park. Um, and it was a little bit uh, an interesting experience. Um, and the whole uh, state of Mecklenburg as a peak and restoration uh, project, uh, kind of trying to, to restore these areas. Um, uh, facing sometimes quite considerable conflicts with the agriculture who try to use the area. For the past two years, I've been um, on loan working for GIZ, the German Development Corporation in China, 
and we have a wetland biodiversity conservation project. In the northeast of uh, uh, China, we have two pilot sites with whom we are working. And um, uh, used to be the called Northern Wilderness. 50 years ago, 90% wetlands. <coughs> right now, it's less than 10% wetlands remaining. Has, be has, has become the grain basket of China. Uh, incredible importance of the area to feed the population and uh, in enormous pressure on the remaining wetlands um, uh, to, um, well, in danger of being converted despite protection status uh, for agricultural purposes. However, uh, the authorities have already um, identified uh, uh, the extreme value of the peak and the wetlands <coughs> in that area in uh, maintaining these, these different functions. Um, uh, and uh, they are also trying to restore the areas. However, the restoration is a bit done like this. And so putting water in, and sometimes the outcome is not as a beautiful habitat for birds that they would like to see. So uh, there's a, somehow, often, quite often, a, a bridge between kind of, let's say, fully fleshed, analyzed restoration proposal and plan towards a hands-on uh, hands restoration project. And <coughs> uh, second observation as regards restoration is that um, uh, sometimes they opt for large uh, money-intensive restoration projects rather than uh, restoring uh, some of the ecosystems which are on the way of degradation. So, because sometimes nature can do the, the job itself over a longer period of time. And, uh, but uh, um, it's not so fancy if you don't have uh, these big boulders uh, restoring the landscape. That's a little bit the experience I have. Okay, that's very, very useful, actually. Yes? Yeah. Hi, I'm Dorothy Herr from the ICN Global Marine and Polar Program. And sort of working on a bit of a related overlapping field of what's often called blue carbon, coastal carbon, so the, the similar role um, that peatlands show in, in coastal ecosystems. And I, I would be interested also to see from um, maybe in the discussion, how do you um, work more towards a, a, a land-based approach or coastal sea-based approach where specifically where we have these issues of the drivers and agriculture, etc. how do we, because similarly, you know, we've been the new kid on the block, if you like, when it comes to, to carbon sequestration, etc. But how do we ensure that <coughs> it's not this sort of either or, it's either forest or peatlands or coastal, but really look at how can we integra integratively look at the drivers and, and, you know, I think in the end what we all want are the nature-based solutions and, and how we can put them all together into, into one system. Yeah, I mentioned uh, the idea of I think I mentioned the idea of carbon sequestering landscapes, you know, where, where you have um, several different types of habitat which get them into decent condition and manage them sustainably, then they could be, become carbon sinks. Um, but also you build that resilience as well to uh, um, guard against future climate shocks. So, humans <coughs> you know, is one example, of course, but uh, you know, there's, there's a whole range of other habitats as well. Any, anybody else? Yeah, I'm Eugenie Genotinovsky, Baltic Fund for Nature Russia, and also I'm working for the development of Fertile Flink International in Russia. Um, so the situation for northwestern Russia with peatlands and with wetlands, I think it's one of the better within the Russia because most of our wetlands are covered within different uh, types of protected areas. But for many others region, uh, uh, the degradation of wetlands is a big problem. And also I know that there are many problems with trying to re restore by re-rating wetlands. In many cases, so there are some cases uh, mostly around Moscow, they had a large program two or three years ago, restoration of peatlands there, and the result was negative, finally, because they, they've got finally a wet forest uh, and not restored peatlands, so they had, and, and no one really knows uh, what to do, but there is a political will to do something. So that's a big challenge for us. We, we, we've got some sheets at the back with some suggested actions going forward. Um, and um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll dish those out in a minute. We'll come back to them at the end because we've 
quite like your thoughts on. We, we would actually like to pick pick uh, the top three actions which we, we would like <coughs> to focus on <coughs> as the as the uh, UK Peatland Program advances. So both of you have actually mentioned this that this lack of, kind of technical knowledge or yeah. you know, rather yeah. um, we're we're experimenting as we go along. Um, so maybe that's that, that is one of the actions to try and share experience and um, <coughs> communicate those best practices, best practice practice examples where we've actually succeeded. Um, and in some ways, that the point of our publication demonstrating success was was, was to do that. We've got a number of copies at the back if you want to pick a few of those up at the end. But. Okay, we've got. Uh, the, sec the second point there is barriers to action. Did, uh, did anyone, I mean, you've, you've obviously touched on that already. We've, we've probably gone. <coughs> that. Um, is, is there any any requests uh, at this point? Any any questions for myself and Clifton that we might want to try and answer? Yes. Can I just uh, <coughs> ask the last speaker to explain uh, why it failed? I've, I've, I've got some colleagues working in Indonesia who have been working on uh, trying to overcome degradation in peatlands. And to me, who is not a specialist in the topic, I, I thought filling in the canals would be an obvious thing to do and that would start the rehabilitation process. <coughs> the word is it's much more complicated than that. So um, I'm intrigued to hear why your system failed, what particularly went wrong, and what was the experience of the British chap who's working all over Britain? How have you guys been going and are you... Uh, Optimistic or pessimistic? So first, um, I think with an issue around speed, and often some of these restoration projects attract a lot of money, and a lot of people want to get. Gentleman here was saying, "Right, machines involved." And actually, you don't need to do that. And actually, it's it's degraded slowly, so you want to rewet it slowly. You don't want it to suddenly go from a. Uh, Degrade for 50 years, and suddenly you block all the ditches, and suddenly we wet it, expect instant results. Um, so a lot of the success we've had <coughs> has just been. Um, so you see a lot of piling gets used, and often we found rather than sort of using piling, sometimes you can just um, you can chip. Rob, during the projects I've been involved in, we were re removing um, conifer trees, usually six spruce. Or um, lodgepole pine that grow very, very slowly. They're in very deep heat, um, and you try and put, basically you need to remove these trees because they're sort of slowly re-wetting it. And then the easiest thing we found is to mulch the trees up, or to um, if you want to block a drain, you can use machines called brush balers that will bale, bale it like baling straw. And you create a, uh, a thing that's like a big sausage, and you put that in the ditch. And that kind of works a lot better than just um, sheet piling. It depends on the size of the ditch. I mean, some of the ditches will be two, three meters deep, so you need more than more than just a branch. Um, I think a lot of it is around speed that people want. It's a it's a one. They've got funding for a year. It needs to be a one year project, and they want to see results in a year. I'm going to ask if we can use the Robin mic. Um, Really received a large 
uh, areas of water, water and the peat below. So that's that's a big problem for us. <coughs> <coughs> Could I seek your indulgence just to ask another question, which is, what would be the early signs of failure or the early signs of success? How would you know whether you're likely to be succeeding or you're on the right track? Well, of course, it depends where you are in the world and I think how degraded your people is. Um, but from certainly from the UK experience, the very, very heavily degraded people in the North Pennine, for example, um, one of which I should have fixed up where you get these very, very big gullies. Um, you need a different technique, and any vegetation coming back at all, and any stabilization of the field surface is probably um, a sign of success. Um, my own organization has had a lot of experience um, restoring raised bogs, which are small bogs of urban landscapes. Um, and the clear sign of success there is stagnant. And that will be the case for many, many pigments across the world where, where the stagnant is the main peak building. So as, as soon as you see a, a percentage cover of stagnant increasing, then you know you've got a sign of success. I think, I think the Russian example is probably